Welcome back guys, it's time for another project, another lesson, another week. We're going to be studying what's called the Hoyne method, which is an improved version of the Euler algorithm. And we're going to be expanding our ability to integrate differential equations so that we can handle coupled first order differential equations. So let's go ahead and get started. The first question is why improve? It seemed to work pretty well. But the truth is as the problems we study get more complicated, and get more uh, interdependent pieces get, get involved, uh, the Euler method turns out to be awkward because it is extremely slow if you want to achieve high accuracy. So the improved Euler method, which we're going to discuss this week, is sort of a first step in the direction of trying to do a better job of maintaining some accuracy in the results. So let's, let's talk about it. The, uh, the idea is, let's say you start at a particular value of x, and you're trying to predict what's going to happen to some function at larger values of x. And all you know at that moment, at, I mean at that particular place, x1, is the slope. So you evaluate the slope using the recipe that we talked about last time, this function f, and you extrapolate out to x plus delta x. Now, in the Euler method, you would be done. That would be your answer. The improved Euler method said, no, wait a minute. The slope has changed in between x1 and x1 plus delta x. So let's take what we would get if we had used the slope at x1 plus delta x, go back to x1 and extrapolate that out to x1 plus delta x. Now, as you can see in this example, the slope at x1 is less than the average slope between x1 and x1 plus delta x. And the slope at x1 plus delta x is greater than the average slope. So one idea is take the average. Split the difference between what you'd get if you took the slope at x1 plus delta x and the slope at x1 and use that to extrapolate. And as you can see, the answer using that slope is much closer to the correct exact answer than what you would have gotten had you used the Euler algorithm. So let's take that step by step. First, we get the slope at x1. We'll call that f1. Then we jump over to x2, and we evaluate the slope at x2. Okay, that's the idea. That's f, uh, <coughs> excuse me, s2 is s1 plus the slope evaluated at x1 times delta x. Then we get the slope at that point. We evaluate the slope at point x1 plus delta x, and uh, we call that f2. Then we get the best guess for the intermediate slope, that's the average of f1 and f2. We multiply that by delta x, and we add that to s1. That becomes s3, which is our new guess at the state at x1 plus delta x. That's the idea. Now it turns out this method is second order. What that means is the um, the error goes like dt squared rather than dt. On the other hand, Euler's method is first order, which means that the error in Euler's method goes like dt rather than dt squared. So an uh, easy way to think about that is you, if you half the time step in the Hoyne method, you get one-fourth of the error in the final result. But if you have the time step in Euler's method, you get half the error in the final result. If you make a graph of the error versus the, I'm sorry, if you make a graph of the log of the error versus the log of the time step, in the Euler method, you get a straight line with a slope of 1. Okay, if you think about that, that means that the error goes like dt to the 1 power. On the other hand, if you graph the log of the error versus the log of the time step using the Hoyne method, you get a slope of about 2, which means that the error goes like dt squared. So that sort of confirms our notion that the Hoyne method is second order and the Euler method is first order. Uh, in the notebook that you'll be using for the second project, I have a couple of programs in there that illustrate that, and you can see exactly how this graph is produced and exactly what it means. So, uh, and this basically, this slide just says exactly what I just said. If you use the Hoyne method, and you have the time step, you get four times the accuracy. If you use the Euler method and you have the time step, you only get double the accuracy. So, 
And the other issue that we need to discuss is this notion of state as a vector. So basically, problems get more complicated, and you need more variables to keep track of what's going on. Okay. Uh, so in the case, say, of a in the case that uh, we're going to study in the project this week, we're going to be trying to launch a spacecraft to Proxima Centauri, which is the nearest star. And we need to keep track of where the spaceship is at every moment in time. We also need to know how fast it's going. So the relationship between force and time relate, uh, deals with the, <laughs> excuse me, the rate of change of the velocity. But that has an impact on where the thing is. So we, our state, to keep track of what the spaceship is doing, is going to need a position and a velocity. It's a two-component object. Um, and so that means that ds dt is now a two-component object. And our formula, our recipe, f of s and t, is now a two-component function. It needs to keep track of the derivative of position with respect to time and the derivative of velocity with respect to time. So the question is, how do we manage that extra complexity? The answer is, we treat state as a vector. A vector is basically an object that has multiple components that we can keep track of it as a single object. Vectors can be differentiated, they can be multiplied, they can be added and subtracted. You can do a lot of things with vectors that you can do with regular numbers. The other nice thing is that there's a very nice vector implementation. It's called the array object in um, Python that we'll be using. And we can take advantage of the fact that all the business of adding and multiplying and dividing and so on with vectors has already been taken care of so that our code can remain quite simple. Let's think of an example using the Euler's method and Hoyne's method um, that involves a state with more than one component. And the example that I came up, up with for the slides is the simple harmonic oscillator. Simple harmonic oscillator is uh, an object that has uh, a force acting on it that's proportional to its displacement from equilibrium. One example of that is a, a mass hanging from a spring. But what I want to do is add an extra wrinkle. In addition to the weight pulling down on the object and the spring pulling up on the object, I also want to add some drag. So we're going to throw in some air resistance or some viscous fluid resistance. or some, In this case, it's a viscous fluid resistance because it's proportional to the velocity, not the velocity squared. But the point is that to get the rate of change of velocity, we need to know not only where is the mass, but also how fast is it going. So in fact, our dvdt function depends on both components of the state vector. And uh, so that means that when we write out ds dt is f of s and t, now the s has to be a vector because we need to keep track of not only how fast the thing is going, but also where it is. Because the force that's acting on it depends on both on where it is through the spring force and how fast it's going through the viscous damping force. So, that's the idea. I should also point out that um, I've been using the word vector, and I don't want you to be confused. In this case, vector doesn't mean a vector pointing in space with x and y and z components, but simply an object that has multiple components that track along with each other. So, in this case, the vector s is a position and a velocity. It has a position component and a velocity component. The components don't have the same dimensions, they don't have the same meaning, they're very different, but when you take the derivative of s, you get the derivative of y with respect to time and the derivative of vy with respect to time. And when you add a 1s to another s, the components add, and so on, sort of like vectors. So that's really what I'm talking about. All right, so the time rate of change of a state is going to be a vector. And that means that the derivative of s with respect to t has a velocity component and an acceleration component. If we use an NumPy array to implement the state, then we can multiply an array by a scalar and we get a new array. So we can implement the Euler algorithm very simply. In fact, it looks exactly like it looked before because we use the state as a sort of a stand-in for the whole state. And the derives function accepts a state at a time. It produces a derivative of a state. And the derivative of a state times a change in time gives us the change in the state. But in this case, the change in the state will be a vector. It'll be the change in y 
comma, the change in V. And if you add the change in the state to the old state, you'll get the new state. And each component will use that same relationship. So in fact, this Euler step function, which we used when S was just a scalar, will also work equally well when S is a vector. Now, that's pretty cool. So these things uh, look exactly the same as they looked before. Now what about the derives function? Uh, it still needs to return dsdt, but now dsdt is a vector. So in order to compute it, what we need to do is to pluck out the position component of the vector and the velocity component of the vector, and then use those to compute the force. So in this case, the force will be minus k times the position minus b times the velocity. Then the acceleration will be the force divided by the mass. Notice that the acceleration is determined by the force. The force is determined by the state. And once we have the acceleration, we're done. Because the whole point of the derivatives function is to compute the derivative of the state, which means we need dy dt, which is nothing other than dy, which we already have, and dvy dt, which is ay, which we just computed. So we create a new array that contains vy and a, we bundle it up into an array object, and we return it. And that enables us to use the same Euler implementation that we used before without having to change any single thing in the code. And that's the idea. All right, let's look at the main loop. So <clears throat> the notion is we're going to run our calculation as long as t doesn't exceed a certain maximum time. And every time through the loop, we're going to take one Euler step. Now, the Euler step method accepts a state, a time, a derives function, and a dt. And then we get a new state. And then we'll just increment the time. Notice that uh, because the Euler step doesn't keep track of the time itself, we need to update the time outside of the function. We're going to find on later that there are some built-in functions in the SciPy libraries that keep track of time as well, in which, in which case we'll let it keep track of the time. But we'll learn about that later. For, for now, for let's now, just let's keep just track, keep track of, the of the time ourselves. ourselves. Finally, um, if we want to make a graph of position also, or speed as a we, function of time, uh, we can still use Python list to save results of the integration to make a, uh, a graph or something for visualization later. Okay, let's talk about those lists. Um, first of all, if we want to keep track of the position and the time and the velocity, we can start with a list that just has the initial values. And then in the loop, we can append, use the append method of those lists to throw in the new values of y, v, and t. It's convenient to pluck out of the state the current values of y and v. In fact, I think in some of my code, I don't even bother writing y equals s sub 0. I just say y list append s sub 0 and v list append s sub 1 because it basically accomplishes the same thing. The other thing, to get the thing started, we need to initialize the state vector. And we can do that using the array constructor, just as we have before, by putting the initial state as the array containing the initial position and the initial velocity. Then when we want to get y or v out, we just access s0 to get y and s1 to get v. Now, what if we want to switch to use Hoyne's method instead of the Euler method? Well, it's quite easy. We simply use the Hoyne step function rather than the Euler step function. But because we're using s as an array object, we don't actually have to change the code at all. This is exactly the same code we used when s was a scalar. And if you look at the results, you can see that uh, the exact solution and the Hoyne calculation are almost identical in this picture for the simple harmonic oscillator. But the Euler method with the same time step is pretty wildly different. So the Hoyne method is well worthwhile if you have a definite time step you need to use and you don't want the thing to take very long. You can improve your results using the second order method. Um, that's pretty easy to understand. And that's the end. So we'll see you guys next time.